Hello and welcome. It's that time again, the monthly and finally podcast review of January. A light-hearted review of the month in football, a month which was mostly notable for a few people panicking over their winter break plans in the golf. So straight into the review, and Zlatan returned to AC Milan on a free transfer from LA Galaxy. No doubt his wages will be immense, despite Zlatan being old enough to remember when the ball had laces. I suppose when you do as little actual work as he does, you can probably play into your 50s or 60s very easily. This month, the statue outside Malmo Stadium showed more movement as it was removed from its place outside the ground. After having a toilet seat placed over various parts, graffiti sprayed over it, its nose cut off, being set on fire, and a second attempt at soaring through its legs finally succeeding toppling it, it was taken away for repair. The club say it will be back when fixed up. You do wonder if it is worth the effort. It's not like he spent his career at the club winning them hundreds of trophies. He ran off chasing money as soon as he possibly could. Not sure how he qualified for the statue in the first place, really. Speaking of old men, and Japanese striker Kazutoshi Miura has signed a one-year deal with Yokohama FC at the ripe old age of 52. Even the club's head coach is younger than him. Heck, even I'm younger than him. Former Blackpool and a thousand of the club's manager Ian Holloway has turned out to be a cheap date. All it took was a fish supper and he was not only back in the game as a manager but he also bought some shares in Grimsby Town as well as taking charge. Anyone have his number? I have some shares for sale at the moment in a business that could do with a manager. Darren McMahon became the second manager to quit League 2 side Macclesfield Town this season. They're still looking like avoiding relegation despite a six-point deduction for non-payment of wages and failure to fulfil a fixture against Crew Alexander in December. Mach have turned to Mark Kennedy, who joined the club as part of Sol Campbell's backroom staff to take over. Kennedy has a difficult job in his hands as the club face a misconduct charge for failing to fulfil a fixture against Plymouth in December after it was served a zero-capacity notice by their local safety advisory group. Financial troubles there are getting worse, though a winding-up petition over an unpaid tax bill was adjourned for the tenth time after owner Amar al Qadi revealed that bids to buy the club have been accepted in principle. I bet he'd be glad to offload it. Sheffield Wednesday became a talking point during January as they released a 10-year season ticket that will be valid for a minimum of 15 years. Confusing, I know, but in essence it is a 10-year season ticket from the season they win promotion. If they win promotion, of course. I wonder if they can be passed on to grandkids. Charlton fans can finally celebrate the end of the nightmare reign of Roland de Châtelet after he sold up to East Street Investments. Their persistent protests against his ownership have finally borne fruit. They will just be hoping now that it's not a case of out of the frying pan and into the fire. Chris Wilder is beginning to get a bit of a reputation for taking a chance on players that have flopped everywhere due to a bad attitude. His latest signing, Jack Rodwell, was once highly rated. Now he is better known as a lazy, injury-feigning, money-grabbing shyster. I'll be interested to see how long Wilder puts up with him, or even if he can work a miracle and get Rodwell playing regularly again. Well, when Garner decides it's time for the change, it doesn't do half measures. They sack the entire coaching staff of all the national teams at every level of the game, youth to adult, male and female game. That's what you call drastic action. After an Iranian military commander was killed in Iraq, mountain tensions in the Gulf region saw a number of people cancel planned training camps in the Gulf region. The US men's team was due to train in Qatar, but those plans were shelved, and Man United decided not to head to the region for their winter break. Others did carry on as normal, such as Celtic, though it's probably worth noting that even a war breaking out in the area would still leave the region calmer and more peaceful than Glasgow. Ajax's American international right-back, Serginho Dest, decided to go home, though, after the club went out to Qatar for a training camp. Apparently he did not feel comfortable and so flew back home to the Netherlands. Man United should probably worry more about the driving of their second-choice keeper, Sergio Romero. He somehow managed to crash his car and leave it wedged under the crash barrier at the side of the road near United's training complex. The Lamborghini was badly damaged, but he managed to escape unhurt. Port Vale's striker Tom Pope was found guilty of making anti-Semitic comments, despite never mentioning or alluding to Judaism. After being asked about the outcome of World War Three on social media, he said the end would be that the Rothschild would be crowned champions of every bank on the planet. Because the Rothschild family are Jewish, his comments were deemed anti-Semitic and he was given a one-match ban and a £1,500 fine. Not sure I get that one, though, myself. 
After Celtic player Ryan Christie channelled his inner Vinnie Jones and grabbed Rangers striker Alfredo Morelles by the balls during an old firm game, the SFA have banned Christie for two matches, plus a third for a previous red card this season. It was certainly an eventful month for Morelles. After he chased someone off who was under his car, the car was taken off for examination though the police found no evidence of criminality. A man was charged with breach of the peace in con- connection with the incident though. Sunderland were in the news as their owner Stuart Donnell put the club up for sale. He only bought the Machams in 2018 but has already been pressured into trying to sell up by fan clubs. You do wonder what they want. Perhaps, perhaps Mike Ashley could buy them if he ever actually sells Newcastle as they always seem very supportive of his ownership, the Sunderland fans. Added to that, the Machams also made a mistake after signing former Rangers forward Carl Lafferty. They posted up a chant from his time with Rangers as the caption to his signing photographs. It must be said, it is unlikely the IT guy running Sunderland's social media accounts would know that a 17th century sectarian war is still relevant in Scotland, so it can probably be put down to a mistake. Birmingham have been charged with another breach of the financial fair play rules, having been recently deducted nine points over a similar breach. They sold their St Andrews ground to their owners to reduce losses to avoid breaching the FFP rules. Derby County are also in trouble for a similar offence after selling their stadium to their owner for £80 million when it was valued at £41 million on their books. Seems to have become the recourse for everyone to get round the rules that way. Despite all this, the CEO of the Football League while all this was going on, the inept Sean Harvey, has been given half a million pound payoff after six years of being paid that much a year to fail to deal with numerous financial problems for clubs such as Berry, Bolton and Charlton. His inability to act on the loophole with regard to stadiums has seen Sheffield Wednesday, Derby County, Birmingham City and Aston Villa all use it rather than bothering to stay within the FFP rules. Another of the teams struggling with finances, South End United, have at least moved a step nearer to sorting themselves out after a winding up order was dismissed. They were being chased for unpaid taxes by HMRC, but they managed to pay them up, so they are safe, for now at least. Malaga sacked their head coach Victor Sanchez after an explicit video of him was posted on social media. Sanchez claimed he was being blackmailed over the video, but that didn't help him with his bosses, which does seem a bit sh- harsh to say the least. Brighton's Aussie duo of Matt Ryan and Aaron Moy made donations to charities dealing with the bushfire crisis in their home nation. Ryan donated $500, Aussie dollars even, per save made in the Premier League over the course of one weekend, costing himself 28000 Aussie dollars, so about £5.50, including five saves made by himself. Brighton itself pledged to match the donations of their players. Nice to know football can do something positive with its cast, at least. And is it Syria or Sunday League? Sometimes it is hard to tell, such as this month when a game between Hellas Verona and Genoa was delayed by 15 minutes while the penalty area lines were redrawn. The ref had spotted that the lines were not straight during his pre-match pitch inspection. It won't be proper Sunday League until you have to avoid parts of the pitch because of dog turds, though. There was a bit of a flap this month over the deal the, the Football Association had made with bookmakers to only show some FA Cup matches on betting sites. Most of the matches were only made available to those who were placed to bet or made a deposit to a betting account. Seemed in really bad taste at the very least, considering the amount of players that have recently revealed battles against an addiction to gambling. Barcelona's Ernesto Valverde never recovered from the consecutive collapses in the Champions League and was sacked by the club despite having them top of La Liga. After failing to get Xavi among others to show any interest in fixing the mess, they turned back to a former target, Kike Setien, instead. The Catalans are beginning to turn into a poison chalice of a job, where even winning the league is not enough to keep your job safe. Despite all the whines from La Liga about the Premier League making too much money, Deloitte's annual money list put Barcelona and Real Madrid top of their revenue money list for the 2017-18 season. Perhaps if the Spanish stopped whining about it and started sharing their money more equitably, like is done in the Prem, they would have less of a disadvantage overall and a better quality league. Man United were third and Bayern fourth ahead of PSG. Man City, Liverpool, Spurs and Chelsea filled the next four spaces before Juve round out the top ten. The surprising one was, for me anyway, Everton making it into the top 20 in 19th place just behind West Ham. Not so much because they had Everton, but because their accounts for the following year were announced and they had made huge losses of £111.8 million, nearly £100 million more than the previous year. 
Despite that, the Toffees say they are committed to operating in a financially sustainable manner. I would hate to see their accounts if they weren't bothered then. To the delight of every European club, the AFCON tournament was moved back to January after one attempt to play it during the summer to stop it clashing with the European season. The weather is too hot in Cameroon during the summer to play then, and that's where it's hosted next time out. Finally, the PGMOL has bowed to pressure and done the sensible thing they should have done from the start and told refs to use pitch side monitors for VAR decisions, like every other country that uses VAR. Even then, they seem to think they know better than everyone else and are only using it for red card decisions. Though I've not seen them used at all so far, even for red card decisions, so it seems like the PGMOL are so arrogant they're just going to ignore everyone else and continue to mess up the game they are meant to be safeguarding. The Hammers managed to do some great work in the transfer window, as they managed to find someone to take Spanish flapper Roberto off them. Admittedly only on loan, but it's still shocking that Alaves would want him at all after seeing him play. Or maybe that's the key, they hadn't seen him play this season. What definitely didn't come as a surprise is that Edison Cavani asked to leave PSG, but an approach from Atletico came to nothing. The only surprise is it took him so long to request a transfer, and that he's still at the club now. Barnsley had claimed that defender Bambo Diaby was missing games from a knee injury until it was revealed in the media this month that he was actually suspended while a failed drug test was investigated. Is this policy of trying to hush up failed tests doing anyone any good? It's just creating an atmosphere of distrust with every player injured now being the subject of whispers. The FA should rethink it. Agents have jumped into action to try and put a halt to FIFA's plans to limit their cut of transfer fees in future. FIFA wants to cap agents' fees at a maximum of 10% of any transfer fee, when currently they're able to ask what they want. Which is why many deals go down the pan with agents asking for tens of millions to make one move go through. Agents claim FIFA is being unfair, but it's hard to see how they can expect anyone to have sympathy with them. Bale's agent, Jonathan Barnett, has promised to fight FIFA's plans in every court in the world if necessary. They really will do anything for money. The FA of Ireland are in financial difficulties. On the verge of collapse in, in fa- the FA of Ireland are in financial difficulties. On the verge of collapse with league football in the country close to being shut down due to the lack of money. Their answer is to bring in Niall Quinn to sort out the league game in the country. Obviously, they had missed the disaster of his time with Sunderland. Lovely man, but that is the problem. It's, it's too nice to get things done. Hopefully it's just a figurehead for people to rally behind because his track record of being in charge is not the best. West Ham revealed losses in their yearly accounts and one of the pawn barons says that remaining in the Premier League is an absolute necessity. Sullivan also claimed that the board made a decision at the beginning of 2018 to embark on an investment programme that would bring in a world-class manager, invest in better players and making significant investment into the club's infrastructure. Except that what actually happened was, David Moyes convinced them to bring in a consultancy firm to look over the club during his first spell in charge. The consultants told the board that it was a League One club in terms of infrastructure recruitment and training facilities. They responded by doing no investment into infrastructure recruitment and training facilities and instead replacing Moyes with Pellegrini, the so-called world-class manager. Working well for them so far, that is, isn't it? The Canadian Premier League has increased to eight teams with an expansion franchise based in Ottawa, owned by Spanish club Atletico Madrid. That adds to Atleti's Mexican Liga MX side, Atletico San Luis. Seems an odd choice though, I can't see what they stand to gain from having a team in Canada. There was a very nasty incident as a group of Man United fans were reported to attack the home of the club's executive vice chairman, Edward Woodward. Luckily, there just happened to be a scum journalist waiting for them to film it all. Sheer coincidence, obviously. The group chanted abusive and offensive songs about Woodward, including suggesting he was going to die, and one of them threw a red flare over the gate. All just conveniently caught on camera. And China have had to put back the start of their domestic season due to the coronavirus. They have not yet decided when they will actually start the season. Instead, they have just put it on hold until the crisis is over. With the wage cap now and spending limits, it does make you wonder if Chinese football is ever going to recover fully from this. It certainly seems it will no longer be seen as the threat by a European football as it once was. So, there we have it. A quick round-up of a January that seems full of bizarre appointments and odd choices. Take care. Bye-bye.